let's get started uh, by looking at a simple information processing model. Um, this model is, uh, is basically based on a simple information processing model, based on the original model proposed by Atkinson and Schifrin back in the late 60s. It has changed and adapted over time, um, but, but most of the models are, are pretty similar and, and follow this general um, structure. So when the mind is looking to process information, you can imagine uh, it going through a series of um, internal uh, cognitive structures. Uh, you can look at the little picture of me on the left there, uh, and you'll see me uh, basically uh, presenting uh, to a crowd. So you can imagine that you're sitting in a lecture hall or or a room or a workshop and listening to me talk and seeing me present. That would be input that's out there in the world around us. That's information that we're trying to acquire. Um, so typically we, we get it through our senses. Um, most often in learning situations we've got visual, auditory, and sometimes hands-on tactile experiences. Uh, smell and taste don't often make it to learning situations, but they could. Um, this information uh, first comes to our uh, sensory memory, and this is a, a true form of memory. This is essentially uh, our, our sensory storage and is, is very, very brief. Um, the information that's in sensory memory doesn't all work it, all make it into our short-term memory or, or what I'm calling the cognitive working space here. Uh, only bits and pieces make it into that cognitive working space. On the one hand, because there's very, very limited space um, in our cognitive working space, um, and because we actually have to exert some effort to extract that information and bring it into our cognitive working space. And again, this is more or less the same as what, what, what's called short-term memory or working memory. Um, so uh, extracting uh, bits of information from that, uh, all that data that's hitting our senses uh, is um, affected by our executive functions. And executive functions are going to affect the performance of the system across all levels. In particular, um, what we attend to is going to dictate what makes it into our cognitive working space. Um, our emotional state will affect what makes it into our cognitive working space. So if, if we're frustrated or angry, um, then we're less likely to, uh, to process information in the world around us, and that information may not make it into our cognitive working space. And then finally, our motivation, our level of motivation will dictate what we process. And if we're not motivated by the task we're engaged in, or if I'm doing a, a bad job of presenting and, and you're not really um, motivated to learn what I have to teach, um, then very little of that information is going to make it into your cognitive working space. So now, assuming you're paying attention, you're in a fairly stable emotional state, and you're not bored out of your mind, some of that information that I'm presenting uh, to you in that workshop or lecture hall is going to make it into your cognitive working space. Uh, even under those ideal circumstances, we have very, very limited processing capacity within our cognitive working space. Um, so there's, there's some speculation that we can hold seven chunks of information here. Some research has said, no, the, the true number is closer to four. Uh, and I've seen some work that, that actually says that there's really only a single chunk, is a single true chunk of information that makes it into our cognitive working space. Regardless of which theory you go with, um, the bottom line is we have very, very little space and processing capacity within our cognitive working space. So our 
um, we are designed to be very selective and careful in what we allow, what we choose to allow into that cognitive working space. Um, now, most of the memories and information we learn, however, has to go through that cognitive working space. Um, this is where we act on information we learn. This is also where we enter information into our system for the most part. Uh, information has to be in our cognitive working space for a certain period of time before it makes it into our long-term memory. Uh, typically, uh, you need at least five to ten minutes with a new idea or piece of information for that information to enter our long-term memory. Um, that's why I often uh, uh, advise uh, instructors not to move too quickly through content. Um, sometimes I hear, well, I have a lot of content to cover. I have to get through it quickly. Well, if, if you don't allow the students enough processing time to form those long-term memories, you're actually not giving them any information by covering 10 items in uh, half an hour. Uh, the, the, the students have to have enough, long enough capacity to transfer that information to long-term memory. And if that means you cover less material, at least they learn that material. Whereas if, if you try to rush through it, that information doesn't make it into long-term memory. Um, now, the, there are different types of uh, long-term memories that can be formed. And what I'm going to present now isn't exhaustive, but it gives you an idea of the types of memories that can form. Um, so one type of memory we can have is episodic memory. And as you can uh, probably guess from the name, uh, this represents memory for certain events or episodes that have happened in our past. So uh, you can picture yourself being somewhere and you remember what happened during that period of time. The second type of memory, uh, long-term memory, that can form a semantic memory. Uh, so uh, semantic memory means uh, 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 developing or, or uh, developing memories for the meaning of things. So uh, say you, you learn a new word and you learn the de definition for that word. So you develop uh, meaning that's attached to that word. The third type of memory is procedural. Uh, so procedural memory is memory for uh, how to do things rather than sort of a, a, uh, the meaning of things or specific episodes of time. So for example, I usually like to use baseball to highlight how each of these types of memories might look like. So you can imagine that an episodic memory for a baseball game would be you rem remembering going to a baseball game with one of your parents and you remember sitting there next to them having some popcorn and, and watching the game. So you're remembering a particular episode in time that happened to you. Uh, a semantic memory may, may be uh, the type of memory that a baseball coach might have. So the baseball coach might know exactly how you're supposed to hit the ball uh, it might give you tips about how to hold the bat, how to run. Uh, so the, the, the uh, instructor isn't necessarily doing those things. Uh, the, the coach isn't uh, going through those. Uh, they're telling you or explaining to you how best to do them. The third uh, example would be the example of, of somebody who's a great baseball player. So you can imagine a player who knows exactly how to hit the ball. He's got that procedural memory down. But if you ask him to explain to you how they're hitting the ball, they might not be able to do that, which is why sometimes you end up with somebody who's a great baseball player or a basketball player or football player who's a, a really bad coach because they're not able to translate that procedural memory into a semantic memory that they can explain to somebody else. Um, so uh, assuming now we paid attention, we were motivated, our emotions were in check, we, may, we, we, we moved information into our cognitive working space, we worked on it long enough for it to form a long-term memory. When it comes to actually testing whether or not somebody has learned a piece of knowledge, we're looking for an output. 
And to produce an output, we actually have to go beyond the stage of forming that memory. So now we have to ex extract information from our long-term memory, bring it back into our cognitive working space, act on it, and then come up with an output. And the output could, could be writing a paper, um, uh, working on a mind map or some sort of representation using your iPod uh, or iPad, uh, or it could be uh, sort of verbally presenting to the class or answering a question in class. But essentially, there is a lot of processing that occurs in production that could uh, disrupt your ability to show that you've acquired the knowledge uh, that was presented to me in class. So it's perfectly possible that you were able to learn the information I was delivering, but are not able to show me that you've learned it, especially if I'm asking you to present that information using a modality that you're very weak in. So if you have a language-based learning disability and you really struggle with writing, and I ask you to write an essay based on what you learned in my, in my session, uh, you may not be able to really demonstrate your knowledge there, but if I, uh, but if we sat in a one-on-one -on -one session and you talked through what you learned, you, you may be able to demonstrate to me that you actually learned that information. So this gives you uh, a general view of what an information processing model look like, looks like and how it might affect uh, individuals who learn differently within a classroom.